Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, dropping in. Today, I'm going to talk about how to learn. And thank you very much for Domino for hosting this. Uh, please uh, save any questions you guys have until the end, and uh, I'll get to them then. Uh, and special thank you to Anna for organizing this. So uh, I'm going to talk about how to learn. Um, and this is a really interesting subject for me. Uh, I'm a data scientist at True Motion and um, self-taught. I studied physics and electrical engineering and got more into the programming and data science aspect uh, after college. Uh, so a lot of uh, this came from self-study. Uh, and so I became interested in uh, meta-learning, uh, how to learn effectively. Uh, previously, I did work at CERN and research for the NSF and the Department of Defense at uh, various research institutions. Uh, and as I mentioned, now I'm a data scientist at a startup called True Motion. Uh, we do safe driving. So we have an app that can tell if you're driving a car. And uh, if you're a good driver, then you can get a discount on your car insurance. But today I'm going to talk about how to learn. And I have four steps. Choose your what, feel your why, make it easy to start, and make it hard to forget. So number one, choose your what. We want to be careful with uh, choosing our material. Um, and the reason is that even if we're very efficient learners, we might not be effective. Uh, so just because we're going quickly in a certain direction doesn't mean we're going in the correct direction. Uh, that'll actually get us closer to our destination. Uh, so let's uh, start with an example. Uh, I, uh, I practice uh, Krav Maga. Let's say my, my goal is to uh, learn uh, self-defense. So I pick a practical self-defense system like Krav Maga. It's important to have um, sort of a bigger goal in mind, uh, such as practical self-defense, but also to have uh, a more, a tinier, more focused goal for each training session. So for example, in Krav Maga, we have a lot of drills that we do uh, so that we can uh, train different uh, skills. Uh, one uh, exercise that we do is called touching toes. And touching toes is an exercise where you try to touch the toes of your partner without having yours touched. Um, this is a skill, this is a skill building exercise that you can use uh, to effectively uh, learn um, how to gauge distance and how to move with proper body alignment. Um, however, um, there's, uh, this is not a real world uh, situation. So if you do the exercise solely for the purpose of the exercise, solely to not get your toes touched, then you can do stuff like pulling your feet back really quickly uh, uh, which will make your head tilt forward, which is fine if your goal is to not get your toes touched, but if you're now off balance, you won't be able to strike properly and you'll probably get hit. So it's important to have a goal for a specific training session uh, in addition to a big picture goal. Uh, likewise, uh, we want to be specific. So if my big picture goal is to learn a new language, uh, maybe I'm traveling somewhere and I want to uh, get around uh, in the local language, the bigger goal that I would set is to have a five-minute conversation with a local uh, in that uh, language. But a smaller goal uh, that I could use for a few training sessions is learning the uh, 600 most common words in that language, which typically make up the vast majority um, of, spoken, of spoken words. Uh, so again, big goal, uh, precise goal of uh, learning uh, or having a conversation uh, in a different language for five minutes and smaller goal for each session of uh, learning the first 600 words. But uh, I'm a data scientist, so I want to talk about data science. And one common problem that we have in data science is classification problems where uh, there's uh, data that belongs in different groups. In this case, uh, they will, they're labeled by the color. And I'm uh, trying to learn a new type of algorithm. So let's say I'm trying to learn a neural network. Uh, if I have a big uh, picture goal, right? I don't want to simply say I want to learn neural networks. I'll say something like I want to 
uh, implement a feed forward uh, neural network on MNIST, which is a common data set that uh, we use to benchmark uh, different machine learning algorithms. And maybe I'll say with a 2% error rate. Uh, but for a smaller session goal, I'll pick uh, something much, much simpler. So even uh, this example is a little too complicated. I would pick an example where I have, uh, I would pick an example where I have, uh, sorry about that, that should fix the slides. I would pick an example where there, where there is just four points on the screen uh, and I would try to build a really simple single uh, layer neural network that uh, is able to distinguish with just uh, with just uh, one layer those points. Then I would get more complicated either by adding more data or maybe by adding uh, more uh, more complexity to the algorithm, right? Like back propagation or uh, different. Um, different types of activations. So choose your what, have a long-term goal to choose the material, and then the short-term goal to focus individual study sessions. Next is feel your why. So I decided I want to learn neural networks, and I get to it, and then I think, okay, uh, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. And it's really easy to say that over and over and uh, never actually get to the goal. So I want to talk a little bit about the psychology. Uh, that gets us to do things. Um, this is Jake. Jake is a chimpanzee. Um, and if you give Jake a, a slice of apple, Jake is really happy. Uh, but if you give uh, Jake two slices of apple and then you take one away, Jake is no longer happy. So in fact, the research behind this, Jake doesn't get totally crazy. Uh, but monkeys, Capuchin monkeys, with which uh, the study was done and the study was replicated in humans, basically are loss averse. They uh, rather go with uh, a researcher that's giving them a single slice of apple rather than a researcher that uh, seems like he, uh, the researcher is taking something away. So giving two slices of apple and getting one back. And um, the principle that this is showing is loss aversion. And we can use this to our advantage. The way we can do this is basically to put up stakes, to put up something on the line. And one way to do this is you take a good friend of yours and you give your friend a hundred bucks and you tell your friend, okay, for the next two weeks, if I don't spend uh, 30 minutes every other day studying neural networks, then you have to keep my hundred bucks. Uh, simple, effective, you have to have a good friend that will uh, not cheat you and give the money back to you if you do do it, but also a friend that's good enough to keep the money if you break uh, break your study sessions. Uh, so this is lost version, and I have uh, at the end of uh, the slides I have some links to websites that make this easier to do, like stick.com and coach.me. And basically, you can put your money up, uh, and then it's not released unless you give you check in with someone. Uh, with the progress of your goal. One way to raise the stakes for this is actually to um, give, uh, to use an anti-charity. And that's where you pick a charity uh, that you don't want to give money to. So uh, for example, uh, there's charities, uh, there's nonprofits on either side of the abortion uh, debate, and you can pick the side that you don't like and put up money that will be sent to them via these websites if you don't complete your goal. Uh, and it's uh, raising the stakes a lot because now you really don't want that money to go there. So number one is humans are loss averse. Um, next is having concrete versus abstract uh, rewards. So if I tell you that you're 16.2 times more likely to get into an accident if uh, you text and drive, uh, you'll probably agree with me. And then probably next time you're uh, driving and you want to text, you'll maybe be a little bit more careful and a little bit guilty, but still pretty much do it. Um, and that's because it's hard to understand like, okay, well, I probably won't in get into an accident. If my chances of getting into an accident are higher, I probably still won't get into an accident. Uh, and in general, uh, we're not very good at um, what I call feeling statistics and understanding uh, the consequences of actions that just 
raise our chances of uh, bad events. So uh, instead, uh, if someone were to say, okay, don't touch your phone uh, this month while driving and you get uh, 20 bucks, then suddenly, boom, people become uh, much better drivers, two hands on wheels, and they don't text. And finally, a really powerful uh, human motivator is uh, shame. Uh, we don't like to feel shame. We don't like to feel uh, embarrassed. And so, uh, again, this is something we can leverage to our advantage. Just like we can put up money that will be sent to a charity we don't like, or uh, money that will disappear if we don't do what we want, we can also put up our dignity. <laughs> so basically, um, same concept, get a group of friends together either on Facebook or via email or via one of these websites and um, create a sort of uh, challenge pool. Uh, for example, in weight loss, uh, you, the, the winner gets to take the pot of however much money was put in um, whoever loses the most weight or whoever, you know, gets the lowest score on MNIST using a neural network. Uh, but basically, um, being able to put yourself up, uh, in front of others to feel pressure, um, to perform, um, is, uh, is another powerful motivator that we can leverage to make us actually start doing something. So feel your why, put up stakes, either social or financial, uh, reward yourself with good behavior and you can make it concrete uh, if you need to and uh, make yourself accountable. So putting up stakes is important, but it's uh, much more effective if someone else is the gatekeeper, someone else has the money or, uh, and is able to uh, carry through with it. Next is make it easy. So. You decided what your goal is. You have narrowed down uh, your training session to a specific goal, and you have the motivation to do it now because there's money on the line and people will make fun of you if you don't do it. Uh, so now there's a lot of pressure to perform. And what, uh, what we do when uh, there's pressure or temptation is we start feeling anxiety and um, we have to use our willpower to not give in or not procrastinate uh, or um, to be good, basically. And so there's a really interesting uh, internal um, study that Google did. Uh, basically, at some point, uh, they realized that some of their, that their employees in one of their offices was, were eating too many M&Ms. And so what they did is replace the containers that the M&Ms were in. Originally, the M&Ms were in a, a transparent container, and all they did was put them in an opaque container. And what they found out is that over the cor course of seven weeks, um, nine packet, nine vending machine-sized packets of M&Ms uh, per person um, less were eaten. So. Uh, each person on average ate nine packets of M&Ms less uh, over the course of seven weeks, which is a pretty, pretty uh, significant effect. And basically, this is that uh, concept of uh, out of sight, out of mind. It's much harder to resist something that's right in front of you that's bad for an extended period of time if it's uh, right in front of you as opposed to put away where you don't see it. So just like you can put the M&Ms in an opaque container, uh, what we can do is go into a room with no distractions, put on you know, those construction headphones, uh, put on some um, background noise, uh, turn off obviously your cell phone and uh, silence it and turn off email, don't open any email, but give yourself a distraction-free zone because willpower is a limited uh, resource and we don't want to have to use it to contend with our willpower to do the studying, we wanna take away as many distractions as possible. Next is uh, we're sitting and there's no distractions and now we're staring at a screen, maybe a textbook about neural networks or probably online documentation. And uh, 
there's some stress involved, right? Because my goal is to learn neural networks and that's a big goal and it's kind of daunting. Uh, and I started feeling a little bit anxious. And so I, um, I don't start doing it. And so what we want to do here is um, we want to reduce um, the pressure. And the way we do that is by uh, sort of uh, lowering the activation energy to start a training session. And the way we do that is by uh, using something like a Pomodoro te technique, which is really simply, you set a timer for 25 minutes or however long you'd like, and you only commit to doing 25 minutes of work. And while I don't know if I'm able to learn neural networks, I know without a doubt that I can spend 25 minutes trying to learn a neural network. And that can sort of take uh, the pressure away and allow us to just uh, do the work. Uh, basically, what happens uh, when there's a daunting goal ahead of us, we feel pain. And uh, when doing uh, CAT scans of the brain, uh, this looks the same, um, sorry, MRIs of the brain, it, this looks exactly uh, the same as uh, when we feel physical pain. Uh, but when we actually start doing the task, uh, this pain goes away. And in order to make it easier to do the task, we set a really small achievable goal, 25 minutes do, uh, doing the session, start with one session a day. And finally, once we've been able to uh, do a training session, we want to make it easier to do more training sessions. So the way we do that is by creating a habit. A habit is simply uh, a cue, a response, and a reward. And the more times we go through the cycle, cue, response, reward, the easier it becomes to go through that cycle again. And so when we do that first training session, if we can do it in the same room, then every time we enter that room, it'll be easier to do it again. If we always drink the same drink, uh, it'll be easier, it'll trigger a response to do whatever we do when we're doing, uh, when we're drinking that drink. It can be the feel of a table, uh, the feel of an environment, the taste, the smell. You can use any of your senses to uh, make a habit stronger by doing the same things over and over uh, during a training session. So make it easy to start. Get rid of distractions. Lower that activation energy. Plan your quitting time. Know that you only, only need to do 25 minutes on this task today uh, or in a row and then even for the entire day at first. And then make a routine, have the same patterns that you do at the beginning to make it easier to repeat this uh, training session. So now we've started doing it, we have a habit and we're doing it again, but even so we, we can be more or less effective at actually remembering material. In fact, it's really hard to um, get things into our long-term memory. When we're focusing on new material, it's kind of like a chalkboard where you can write things down uh, and you can focus on them while you're there. But you can imagine that as soon as you stop focusing on it, as soon as you turn your back away from the chalkboard, it gets erased. And so we can keep uh, maybe four things in our working memory at a time. And um, four things is not a lot, but it's enough. Um, basically, um, we can make, uh, these things are not of uh, exact size, right? So if you're trying to memorize a number, for example, memorizing the number seven or memorizing the number 27 is the same thing because we chunk it as one, uh, one item. But memorizing the numbers as two and seven is two separate things. So we can chunk things together to make them easier to remember. So when we're focusing on something, we can, we can have four uh, chunks at a time and we can piece them together, make them bigger, but still at any given time, we can think of uh, four things. And once we stop thinking about them, uh, they go away pretty quickly. In fact, they go away exponentially. And there's a famous study uh, done by Herman Ebbinghaus uh, in the 1800s, but it's been um, replicated many times that basically our, um, our memory uh, has a exponential decay. Uh, if you only learn something once, uh, you'll very quickly forget it. 
But as we can see in the figure on the right, uh, as long as we periodically go over the same material again, we can spike our recollection uh, up high. And then when it goes back down, it'll actually go back down to a higher baseline. So we, uh, we'll virtually never uh, forget something after we've gone over it enough times. Uh, so this, uh, this concept is called spaced repetition. So at first you go with, uh, about it uh, you go about it the first time, maybe you review it uh, the next day, then two days later, then six days later, 10 days later, on and on until you have to review it very rarely, if ever, to remember it. And we can use tricks to remember things better. We can use imagery. Uh, our imagery, our um, visual memory is very strong. And uh, we can remember long sequences of events uh, as an image uh, much better than anything else. And so we want to use this and we can use images to re uh, remember better regardless if it's a, you know, a complicated technical topic like neural networks uh, or something, um, uh, something simpler. Uh, one example is if I'm trying to understand what recurrent neural networks are, um, I can, uh, so at first I read up and I realize, and I learn that uh, recurrent neural networks are good because uh, they can pass information between uh, disconnected layers. So uh, they can pass information between um, training time, uh, time steps uh, from many steps ago. Uh, basically, uh, recurrent neural networks can remember things from uh, uh, from thing, uh, from a while ago rather than just uh, from the previous state. And the way I personally remember this is I have a friend called, uh, a friend whose name is Marquise, and Marquise has a really good memory. So uh, the way I remember uh, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, and Marquise is boom, I put them together. And uh, anytime I think of RNNs, I have to just remember Oh, my friend Marquise has a really good memory. Uh, recurrent neural networks allow you to use information from several time steps ago. But I can take this further. Let's say I'm trying to learn what um, LSTMs, long short term memory uh, are, which is a specific type of recurrent neural network. Well, LSTMs are really good because uh, they can remember, I'm saying remember in air quotes, information from many time steps uh, ago. And the reason they're able to do that is because they do uh, something, they take care of something called the vanishing gradient problem uh, or the exploding gradient. And um, the way that, uh, well, uh, so, so they do that and they're able to remember things from long ago. So what I have to do is I have to take my picture of Marquise and I have to envision that somehow. So LSTMs uh, get rid of the, exploding uh, or vanishing gradient problem. So uh, I'll picture Marquise uh, putting his hand over a volcano that's erupting and uh, helping people from uh, vanishing by uh, saving them from the volcano. And by imagining that, uh, it's a ridiculous image and that's why it works. I'll never forget that image. And so I can always tie RNNs and LSTMs to Marquise. Um, next, when you're doing your space repetition, at first you want to remember, uh, you want to make sure you remember it, but then when you're going over, uh, these different sessions, you don't want to just, um, you don't want to just reread the material. You want to test your recollection of that material. And so the way you do that is by uh, unit testing uh, your brain. Unit tests are small pieces, the uh, small pieces of code that you run, that run your other code to make sure it's working properly. And uh, this sort of concept is the most effective way uh, to learn, uh, according to uh, Barbara Oakley and Terence uh, Sanowski, who uh, created a course called How to Learn, uh, which again I link to in the slides at the end of this. And uh, when you're going over session, uh, your training examples, whether it's uh, a notebook uh, with uh, 
some examples in it, or if you're going um, over um, flashcards, it's important to not just reread uh, the question and the answer, but to actually go through in your head and uh, try to think of the solution and only look at the solution if you can't recall it. And that's the quickest way to uh, be able to tell if you actually remember the material and the quickest way to get things into your long-term memory uh, from, from, again, your short-term memory. Uh, next is we want to, uh, once we've had a few of these sessions, we want to think creatively about this problem. And it's important to uh, think about the problems uh, in more than one way. So uh, at first, we're on that chalkboard and we're focused and we're putting together these chunks and we're trying to fit them together. But then what we want to do is let these chunks play with other ideas that we have. Uh, maybe something that we learned in a different field um, in martial arts can relate to something in neural networks. And uh, we can use those ideas uh, together to come up with better new ideas. And the way we do that is we uh, sort of let these ideas play with each other in what's called the diffuse mode of thinking. So when we're not super focused and putting these, um, trying to understand these four things, um, it's more like our ideas in our head are bouncing around and interacting with each other. And there's two ways, there's a few ways to go into diffuse mode, but basically your mind has to be relaxed. So uh, you can be either uh, close to falling asleep or laying down, eyes closed, or you can be exercising. And both of these uh, are very important, um, both in terms of being in the diffuse mode while letting your brain sort of uh, go to, around and uh, think about these uh, without too much focus. Uh, but both are also shown, that is exercise and sleep, uh, are uh, absolutely incredible for uh, brain growth. And you can see uh, neurons um, uh, growing uh, after sleep. Uh, if you look at um, look at scans of the brain uh, before and after sleep, you can actually see how uh, the neurons have grown. Um, and lots of studies have also shown, again, the same effect. Uh, your brain gets healthier if you do physical exercise on a regular basis. Uh, so both are very important. To summarize, uh, after we've been able to uh, get to those uh, sessions, uh, study sessions, we want to make sure that that information uh, properly stays in the brain. And the way we can do that is um, by using mental tricks to uh, memorize things, making sure that they're in our working memory so that we can put in uh, time to then put those uh, chunks together and understand and see how they fit together. We want to space those out over uh, different short, easy study periods over a long period of time. And we want to test yourself often, uh, test ourselves often. That is looking at, um, uh, not looking at the answers, but getting ourselves to try to remember the answer uh, and revisit the ideas in diffuse mode. Now, the most important thing here is deliberate practice. So basically, it's going to be hard work, and we have to put in the effort. Uh, and these tricks aren't a way around that. It's a way around making our deliberate practice more effective, so that we can use um, we can use these techniques uh, to be more efficient. But again, um, it's by guiding all this in the right direction that we're actually effective. So in summary. Choose your what, choose the material, point yourself in the right direction, feel your why by creating consequences using tools like uh, stick.com or coach.me. Make it easy to start, lower that activation energy by putting the distractions away and uh, committing to a very short, easy session and make it hard to forget. Space repetition uh, without your notes. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I'll take questions now through the chat session and just wanted to give a quick shout out. Uh, my company is releasing a, uh, a consumer app. Um, again, like I said, we're doing safe driving. So if you're interested to see how your family members drive and compare your driving habits with theirs, uh, you can become a beta tester for our app. 
uh, go through motion.com uh, forward slash app and you'll have access to these slides so you can check it there and at the very end are the resources that i mentioned for learning uh different uh resources for either blocking out distractions or setting stakes or uh, the resources that i used to um come up All right, so I'm looking at the chat now. Does anyone have any questions that I can answer?